Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, we're reporting from the coast of Washington State. We're here with the Nebraska Soybean Board's See For Yourself program, seeing how Nebraska soybeans are being shipped to international buyers through Grays Harbor and the Port of Tacoma. We'll talk with Roy Smith in just a bit, but first, here's what's coming up on our visit to Washington. It rains in Washington, a lot actually. As most of their home state was in the midst of unseasonably warm temperatures, 15 farmers from Nebraska learned how their soybeans moved from the field to the ports and to buyers overseas. As part of the Nebraska Soybean Board's See For Yourself program, these farmers saw firsthand how their checkoff dollars are working to increase productivity, profitability, and demand. Here at home, every other row of soybeans is exported each year. In 2010, soybeans were the nation's number one agricultural export, with China and Mexico as the biggest buyers. Later in the show, we'll talk with Gary Nelson, the executive director of the Port of Grace Harbor, about how soybean meal from Nebraska reaches international buyers in the Philippines. We'll show you how the Tacoma Export Marketing Company leans heavily on the soybean industry, shipping 95% of its beans to China. And we'll hear what Nebraska farmers had to say on their trip to the rainy coast of Washington. Back in Nebraska, just in time to bring the rain with us and drag our next guest out of the planter tractor, Roy Smith is joining us. <laughs> You're welcome, by the way, for <laughs> bringing you. it back. Uh, we talk on Tuesday afternoon. Last week was a good week for corn and soybeans. This week has taken a little bit of a hit through Tuesday. We're a few right. days away from the end of the week yet, but I was reading on agriculture.com your thoughts about the run. And you think this isn't necessarily unusual, the run we've seen so far. It's not really. The, first of all, if you, if you look at the long-term charts, you see a gradual uptrend uh, actually starting around the 1st of October, and that's almost exactly when it was this year. And you look at, at the current chart, and it's been almost straight up, almost a 45-degree angle, all the way going back to October. There have been a, a couple of blips in there, but not very much. And so... Uh, especially in, in February and March, and it's just been a gradual uptrend as we go, and pretty strong uptrend. And looking at individual years during that time, it's pretty common to see the biggest part of the uptrend in the spring come in the first two or three weeks. And here we are basically three weeks into March, right. and, and uh, we've got this, uh, shall I say, scare? I hope <laughs> I can say scare and, and not a change in trend. We'll know by the air date of this, That's but right. you still think there's a possibility that there are a few more cents in the market? It would be real unusual to see the market fall out of bed now. That doesn't mean that we couldn't get a, a, a major correction, maybe 50 cents or even a dollar a bushel on beans and a comparable amount on corn. But uh, chances of it, you know, just really coming unglued and crashing and until we see how fast the planting is going to go and things like that. And as we talk about all this and planting, the intentions report comes out a week from now, as will first quarter usage of stocks. How big of an effect could we see there on the market? Well, it could be quite a bit. I mean, I guess the thing that, that I look at, though, we hear 
guess is all the way from 94 million acres of corn to 97 million acres of corn. How could it be bearish? Well, it could be bearish if we saw the planting increase compared to that. The other side of that is, if we're going to have 97 million acres or more, where are we going to put the or more? Right. There's where's not that many acres out there. And so. where's the demand going to come from right. in the end? Right, right. Now, South America has factored into this for the past month, two months, three months, four months, and it's been weather concerns. Any more with them starting harvests down in South America, how much more can it really play on the market here? Well, yields are not going to change now because of the lateness of the season. The perception of yields mm -hmm. could change. I mean, we could end up with a lot fewer bushels than what anybody has guessed. I, I doubt that that's going to happen because usually you get the biggest reaction to a drought as the drought is going on, not after the yeah. drought has ended and we start combining. So I would say the odds of the South American crop being a big factor from now on are, are pretty slim. Could happen, but not likely to. What are you doing with what you have left in the bins, corn and beans? First of all, I've I'm sold out of beans, have been sold out of beans for quite a while. Uh, corn, I've got some sales made, looking to make some more sales before the report that comes out next week, mm -hmm. and then we'll see. Uh, you know, the logical time by the long-term charts to make sales is somewhere around the first two weeks in June. Uh, I don't like to wait that long, so we'll, if we get that you know, rebound off of this pullback, I think that's a good time to be selling something. I mentioned your, I referenced your article on agriculture.com. One thing you said there was maybe pick some trigger points if you do have something right. left. Right. Good. You know, the, really, when when you look at the long-term charts, it's easy to say, well, the the uptrend could end anywhere from the middle of March to the middle of June. That's an awfully big window. You, and there's nothing on the charts really that tells you whether it's going to be earlier or later or sometime in the middle. So I say, you know, if you look at, at the corn market, for instance, at uh, 640 or wherever it ends up and after the little bit of washout the last two days, you know, set some targets up there, 650, 660, 670, or whatever suits your cash flow needs and just get it done. Next week, we'll talk with North Dakota State Extension economist Frayn Olson on the morning of the quarterly grain stocks and prospective planting USDA releases. During our visit to the Pacific Coast last week, we saw how goods, including soybeans, reach international buyers overseas. Both the Port of Tacoma and the Port of Grays Harbor are owned by taxpayers in their respective counties. Companies like AGP, Cargill, and CHS then use terminals in the ports to ship their grain to customers in the east. As you'll see in our reporting from there, the ships in the waters along the west coast are helping farmers in Nebraska fields market their products in homes and stores across the ocean. For many Nebraska soybeans, the ride ends here, half a country away from the fields they were grown in. Grays Harbor and Tacoma, two major shipping ports for goods moving to China, Japan, and other countries in the Pacific Rim. On a see-for-yourself trip to the Washington coast, these Nebraska producers got a glimpse of equipment and machinery used to supply customers with their soybeans. You know, we, ha we have nothing to relate to, really, to compare it to, so that's why it is helpful to see it firsthand because you can't really compare it to anything. Big cranes and bigger ships move millions of dollars worth of soybeans through these ports each year. At the port of Tacoma, over 200 million bushels of grain were sold in 2010, for a total of $861 million. How it's done would be a logistical nightmare for some. Soybeans from the Midwest travel on rails of both BNSF and UP to the ports where they're unloaded into storage or straight into ships. Actually, it's more than I thought. It's much more. I didn't realize they moved as many ships out a month as they do. Grace Harbor fills two to three vessels each month, mainly with soybean meal, a lot of it from Nebraska. The Tacoma Export Marketing Company, or TEMCO, loads 10 ships a month. To fill a Panamax ship, the largest ship able to travel through the Panama Canal, it takes about 600 cars. Lined up, 600 rail cars would stretch nearly 7 miles. 
Tim Bartek of Ithaca says that kind of efficiency is necessary to move the growing amount of grain farmers are now producing. So that surplus don't get to a certain point where it hurts our prices and, and you know, in the end hurts our bottom line. Soybeans and soybean meal can travel in Panamax ships by bulk, but ships can also carry containers filled with different forms of soybeans. The Port of Tacoma hauled over a million and a half of these containers in 2010 alone. On the day we were at McMillan Piper, workers were loading soybean flakes from rail cars into containers. Eventually, the containers will reach Japan, where they'll be used in baby formula. Madison farmer and LEAD program graduate Neil Neidig says the trip answered his questions about shipping via bulk and container. I thought honestly before I came that the container program from what we learned when I was in LEAD in, over in China that containers, a lot of them go back empty and I'm thinking why can't we put grain in it. Honestly for us in the Midwest as soybean and corn producers, Panamax shipping is probably the way to go. Containers are more of a niche market, which is not bad. It's probably, it can't handle the volume that they need or we want to get, we want to sell. This was a different view for many farmers. They see the seed before it goes into the ground and the end result when it's harvested in the fall. But these ports are the final domestic destination before soybeans reach buyers overseas. I think the biggest thing to see out of it is uh, where they finally end up and how they get here. When we hear the backlogs of our local elevators, a lot of people don't know where they do end up. They hear stories of where it's going but they don't know the whole system and how it works. I think going on this tour gives me an idea. I can see the front to end. We kind of get stuck in our own little corner of the world and not sure uh, what happens to our products when we take them to town. Uh, we raise the soybeans, we take them to town and kind of don't really know what they're used for or where they go. So it's neat to kind of see uh, who's buying our soybeans, what they're using them for, um, how they're shipped. It's uh, been really interesting. Shipping to those buyers differs from port to port. The Port of Tacoma says it takes a ship around 14 days to reach Japan, a few days longer than in the past as captains are opting to move slower and save fuel. 95% of Tacoma's beans travel to China at a clip of about 15 days per trip. That's two to three days faster than it would take from a port in New Orleans. Because of these ports in Washington, Agriculture is now a huge part of the Pacific Northwest's economy, especially locally. Grays Harbor says its ports account for about 20 percent of the county's employment base. The Port of Tacoma says its activities contribute $90 million a year in state and local taxes. You think about it back home, but you don't think about it on this end, about how much business it actually does for, for the exporting business. So how, much, how many other jobs are involved, the amount of longshoremen and, and everybody else that are working out here to, to get that stuff out of the country. These Nebraska farmers support their state's soybean checkoff, which in turn helps promote Nebraska soybean use in international markets. It also aims to support better soybean transportation options and availability and sales of soybeans to markets in Southeast and East Asia, among others. Key buyers for these shipping ports on the coast. It's nice to know to see what our checkoff dollars are going to, and to see that that they're developing them, and it, and it's it's definitely building infrastructure out here, and uh, it's obviously creating a heck of a good market for our Nebraska soybeans. After seeing how their soybeans arrive here, a long ride from the middle of the country, these farmers now head home at the beginning of another planting season. This time, though, with more knowledge of where the products of seeds soon to be planted will eventually end up. To load the ships we saw in Washington, the ports are using fast-moving conveyor belts to carry grain and soybean meal from storage or rail cars to the ship. Temco has two conveyor systems that can each carry 40,000 bushels of grain per hour. Temco has also taken measures to ensure they can load ships during the rain. They've installed a roof to cover ships and ensure workers continue loading instead of waiting for rain to clear. While we were away, unseasonably warm weather spread across Nebraska, and some farmers may have the urge to get their planters in the field. But UNL Extension Soil Specialist Charles Wartman says it may be a bit too soon. Planting now has the risk that the seed is going to stay in the soil for quite a long time without germinating, if it turns back to normal as far as temperature goes. Uh, and so if you do plant now, you want to plant a little bit deeper than normal and make sure it's well protected with fungicide. Uh, but it's probably better to wait. But on the other hand, you would like to see it all planted by the end of April. 
Wartman adds that for each day after May 1st, UNL researchers estimate a soybean yield loss between 0.25 and 0.6 bushels per acre per day. Since 1982, 107 Nebraskans have died in all-terrain vehicle accidents. In the March Nebraska Farmer, UNL Extension Educator Aaron Nigren explains that ATVs are one of the top causes of accidents on the farm. Nigren lists several key steps that may keep you alive while riding an ATV. Even though not required by state law, Nigren says wearing a helmet is crucial to ATV survival. He also says to slow down, stay off paved roads, and not allow riders. You can read more about Nigren's safety tips in the March Nebraska Farmer. At the Port of Grays Harbor last week, we talked with its executive director, Gary Nelson. Once the leading export port for U.S. grown timber, Grays Harbor now leads the U.S. in exports of American grown soybean meal. We started by asking Gary about the process of getting soybeans and soybean meal from the fields of Nebraska to the port on the coast of the Pacific. AGPs are primarily, they own the facility and we operate it for them. Uh, they dispatch the rail cars, um, usually in unit trains. Uh, soy meal has been primarily, but we're, with the advent of the new facility, hope to be doing some beans as well. Uh, the trains arrive here on the Class 1 railroads into Centralia, which is about 50 miles from here. Uh, one of the things that AGP really likes about uh, the Port of Grace Harbor is that we're served by both the B and the UP, so they have uh, access to both lines. Uh, they arrive, we start calling workers, and we start unloading um, into storage or onto the vessel. And also we provide, in the fall we seem to get a lot of customers coming through, and we, we try to coordinate that with some of the buyer, or, uh, excuse me, supplier or farmer groups come through at the same time. So they, it's easier to come to Grace Harbor and meet the customer than it is to go to China or the Philippines. So. What's the breakdown for soybean meal to soybeans to corn? I mean, rough estimate? Well, rough estimate, you know, historically over the, the first 10 years, it's probably been 97% soy meal. But we just really started the new facility, I think, in mid-December. We've done a couple of uh, shuttle trains of beans uh, so that we can do that. And it's really going to be market uh, oriented. I think AGP designed the facility so that they can either go to soy meal or, or, or cake products or whole grains, just depending on what the market demands. This port was, at first, very large in the timber industry, as big as you were in timber there. In the scope of that, how big is agriculture and soybeans and corn to this port now? Well, we, we've been through a, a period of almost unpre unprecedented growth in a large part due to AGP's presence here. Um, so I, they're probably 70% of our export business right now in tonnage versus tonnage. Um, they've really, I don't want to say replaced, but they certainly have uh, helped us through the transition into being from being timber dependent. How many shipments are going out each month? Ooh, two, two to three vessels a month. And these bit buyers are where mainly? Mainly in the Philippines so far, but we've had we've had it go into Japan. We've had it go into uh, Southeast Asia. Australia's been a, a pretty decent market as well. Um, just to kind of depends on where things go. The facility was originally designed ten years ago for identity identity preserved products, um, so that we do have that ability if customers are interested in you know that extra degree of security in their food chain. Uh, it's possible to do that here. This port is owned by the taxpayers. What is the relationship between the port and the taxpayers? Well, the way I look at it is our taxpayers are essentially the shareholders. Uh, the county is about 75,000 people. The taxpayers, have, through their tax bills, are the, the shareholders, and they elect three elected officials. That's my board of directors, who gives us direction and vision on where they want to see us go. Uh, it's kind of an exciting thing to think about uh, the equity that they've built up over the last hundred years. We just celebrated our centennial last year, um, and it's pretty exciting. It, it was created to provide jobs and uh, local jobs, and that's kind of what we focus on. How, how many local jobs are we talking? We're probably responsible uh, directly for about 20% of the, the, the county's employment base. So that's a huge investment. Yeah. And, and agriculture is at the forefront of it. Now, now, very much so. We haven't traditionally weren't agriculture, but it, it is a big piece of it now. What are the challenges? The infrastructure is obviously enormous. There are input costs, fuel costs are rising. What are the challenges you see on the horizon? Um, trying to stay in front of the customer, but not getting too far. We just have finished a, about a $15 million 
um, rail improvement just to allow AGP to put more shuttle trains and more cars through. Uh, it was about 37,000 feet of track, but you don't want to build it too far in front of them. You don't want to get stuck with an asset that doesn't need to be built. Um, and in that sense, we're very fortunate to have customers like AGP that communicate effectively with us um, and also share the same kind of worth ethic and, and uh, integrity that, that makes us all possible. One of the things I ask the Nebraska farmers is what they'll tell other farmers when they go home. You know, if you're talking to a Nebraska soybean producer, because a lot of your soybeans are coming from Nebraska and sure. Hastings specifically, what do you, what's the message you want to get to them? That we can provide an alternative. I mean, we're not going to, you can't please everybody, but we hope to provide a, a value added product that um, provides them direct access to their customers in the, in the Far East. Grays Harbor exported 1 million metric tons of soybean meal, DDGs, and other dry bulk exports in 2010. With AGP's expansion and construction of storage facilities, Grays Harbor expects to triple that number in the next five years. Next week, we'll show you more from our trip west, including our visit to Imperium Renewables, a biodiesel refinery capable of producing up to 100 million gallons of biodiesel per year. Rain moved across parts of Nebraska this week. Now to forecast what looks to be yet another warm week across the state, here's UNL Extension statewide climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again on Friday morning. Of course, last week we talked about the potential for an upper air uh, troughing pattern to move into the South Central Plains and with the low to cut off and slowly migrate around the South Central Plains and give some tremendous values of moisture, especially in Oklahoma and points southward. That did very, very much pan out. And unfortunately for Nebraska, we did not see nearly the amount of moisture that we were anticipating. Yes, we did see some anywhere from a half an inch to an inch totals for the total storm in southeast and east portions of east central Nebraska. But as you headed toward northeast Nebraska, the precipitation total dropped off rather dramatically. Haven't seen any significant moisture coming out of this region basically in the quarter of an inch range. And then, of course, in western Nebraska, most of the panhandle didn't receive anything from the storm system and only some very light precipitation amounts across the southwest. So some areas did receive some valuable moisture. Other areas, unfortunately, missed out on a very potentially beneficial rain event. So we're going to have to wait for the next significant system to move into our region. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to see any major troughing pattern come in until the last of the month. So really, we're going to be looking at weak cold fronts coming through to generate some thunderstorm activity. And I will bring this point to bear that as this big system is expected to come out toward the end of the month, there is some cold air behind it that may actually bring some freezing temperatures in somewhere in the eastern two-thirds of the United States. And of course, with the wheat crop being as bad as it, or as far advanced as it is to the south of us, that could potentially be very devastating in terms of production. Do we have any cold air in the forecast? Not really, but let's take a look at the upper air models and see how this week should progress. As we go through the models, we'll notice that we have an upper air low, that was responsible for all the precipitation is going to gradually move toward the east. So we'll see rain chances ending for in the southeast this morning. And then we'll start to see a clearing trend as we move through the weekend. So we'll be looking at highs in the upper 60s with extensive cloud cover. Breaking, if it does break earlier, we'll see temperatures bump up a little bit, but we're looking at highs in the upper 70s across the west. Now, as we go into tomorrow, that low now has moved over into the Ohio River Basin. We're seeing uh, ridging pressure building into the south central plains and extending up into the northern plains. Very nice temperatures, highs in the low 70s north to, to possibly even the low 80s across the southwest. And as we go into Sunday, now this ridge is firmly in place. Everybody should be very warm. We'll be looking at highs in the mid 70s across the northeast to the low 80s across south central and southwest Nebraska. And as we get into Monday, looks to be the warmest day across the state as we'll be have a southwest flow aloft. We'll be looking at highs that'll be in the low 80s north to possibly the mid 80s southwest and south central. And on Tuesday, we start to see moisture coming out of the system. So there is a chance for thunderstorm activity, particularly of the high plains and maybe a severe weather outbreak if we can get the front to come through at perfect timing. We're looking at highs in the northwest from the upper 60s, and we'll be looking for the low 80s across extreme southeastern Nebraska. Now, as we get to Wednesday, here comes this system coming out, and that's going to generate the potential for severe thunderstorm activity across western Nebraska. Halfway decent chance of moisture, nothing real extreme, but there is moisture chances. Looking at highs in the mid-60s across the north to the low 70s across the south. And as we get into Thursday, that system moves up the Great Lakes. We should see a drying pattern, highs in the mid-60s across the north to the low 70s across the south. As we go into the 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday to the following Tuesday, we'll be looking at above normal temperatures. And in terms of precipitation, not much in the way of any significant moisture. Thanks, Al. In news from this week's Market Journal Twitter feed, the High Plains Journal recommends cattle producers evaluate their herd health programs. 
No matter where producers are in their spring calving process, the High Plains Journal says they should pay attention to disease prevention and control and say all cattle should be properly vaccinated. CNBC World reports that an MF Global executive has been hit with a congressional subpoena. Edith O'Brien was the former assistant treasurer of the company and worked in the Chicago office, which was designed to help ensure MF Global properly handled customer accounts. The Congressional Committee investigating MF Global believes that O'Brien will have a unique understanding of what went wrong with customer accounts. The Pork Network says housing Parity One, or P1, sows with gilts, improves welfare and performance. At the American Society of Animal Science meeting in Des Moines this week, researchers discuss aggression problems among group house sows. Younger sows usually lose most fights and suffer more injuries, but grouping P1 sows with gilts reduces those injuries. For more ag information, follow Market Journal on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. As we close out today, we told you last August about a mobile app that would help you decide on treatment for soybean aphids. The Aphid Speed Scout app was developed by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and recently recognized as the number one agriculture app for 2011 by CropLife magazine. Next week, we'll show you how you can watch Market Journal wherever you go with the new Market Journal app for mobile devices. Brian Olson will also be with us to take a look at USDA release numbers. And Ron Pavelka from the Nebraska Soybean Board will join us to talk about his recent trip to South Korea and China with the U.S. Meat Export Federation. Until then, I'm Jeff Wilkerson. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.